Hey folks, welcome to my AMA about penoprostheses in phalloplasty. So a lot of you guys have put in a lot of good questions and I'll run through them all. I'm Richard Santucci. I'm a reconstructive urologist and a full-time transgender surgeon at Crane Center for Transgender Surgery. We are the busiest phalloplasty center in the world and subsequently we do a huge amount of penoprostheses in phalloplasty patients. Uh, it can be really hard to get good information about penoprosthesis and phalloplasty, so I'm hoping to sort of clear uh, up all of your questions today. So, I'm running through, I've got my list of questions here. What implants do you offer? Well, we use coloplast implants, and um, you know, there's nothing wrong with AMS, which is the competitor, and probably the AMS semi-rigid is very similar. It's just that the coloplast uh, inflatable prosthesis uh, has a lot of characteristics that make it very good uh, for phalloplasty. So the two options that you have are semi-rigid. Now this is a pretty simple device. It can't break very easily, um, and for like pure reliability, it's probably the best, but it's got some serious problems. Problem one is that it isn't really semi-rigid, it's rigid. It's either rigid in the up position or rigid in the down hidden position. So if you have a busy lifestyle or like to go swimming or running or biking, this may not be the prosthesis for you. The inflatable prosthesis has more moving parts, which means things can go wrong with it. It's not terribly common, slightly more common obviously than the super simple prosthesis. I'll tell you that it has a few components. It has a reservoir. This looks pretty big and it looks a little bit scary, but the fact of the matter is this is hidden under the muscles of your abdomen and most people don't even know where it is. It's so well hidden. There's a uh, rod that goes uh, into the phallus um, and the base of this is actually sewn into the bone. In, in both cases, we sew it into the bone. And then there's a little pump that takes the place of one of your um, testicles. And the device functions by basically pumping it up. So here, I'll pump it down first so you can see. Still got some air in there, let's see. So imagine that it's very pliant and not filled up and then several pumps this has got some air in the system it's not how it would be inside your body so it's not quite perfect you get a much more rigid prosthesis and it should give you enough rigidity uh, so that you can have intercourse usually at the same time of penile prosthesis we put in testicle prosthesis so if you have an inflatable you only need one testicle prosthesis because the pump is one of the, uh, is that sort of acting as one of the testicles. If you have a semi-rigid, then you're gonna get two testicular prostheses. There's two major types. One is a kind of um, silicon that's filled with saline or just uh, regular salt water. And the other was what I call a gummy bear type prosthesis uh, that's solid uh, silicon. These have an additional benefit and we can sort of trim them down. Uh, they come in different sizes. It's sort of small, medium. Usually large is too large uh, to place, and so we don't much worry about them. Okay, I'm interested in the Zephyr, made specifically for trans men. This is a complex story. Issue one is that, <coughs> excuse me, the Zephyr is not available in the United States. So really it can't be uh, used in the U.S. yet. I don't know if they plan to get FDA approval or not. Two is that I am not at all convinced that the Zephyr has characteristics that make it really superior. Uh, for example, the Zephyr has a little bell-shaped end, and the idea there is that somehow that would fill in the glands a little bit better. But the problem is that not everybody's glands is built the same way. And so you've got this bell, what if it doesn't exactly align with, say, the edge of the corona or the head of the penis, and some you got kind of a problem there. Um, it does have a very good backing on it. The end is kind of flat and has grommets in it so you can sew into the bone easier. But I'll tell you, sewing into the bone is not such a problem as it is right now. Right now I use titanium sutures. These are sutures that don't break, can't even be cut without special instruments. Um, 
and uh, so we place the sutures through the bone and then through the tip of the prosthesis, tie it down, and then I kind of entrap the prosthesis again, kind of bring it around again and entrap it up against the bone. And usually that creates a situation where it just doesn't come off the bone and doesn't cause a problem. So I guess my point is that the Zephyr is purpose built, but is it better? I'm not yet convinced. Um, we, I worked together with some of the designers at Coloplast to perhaps design a uh, purpose-made phalloplasty penile prosthesis. And it was incredibly difficult to come up with any new uh, changes that were any better than the existing prosthesis that we have. So prostheses have plenty of problems, which we'll get into, but I don't think their basic design is the main problem. Um, oh, what's the most common complications of penile implant? And when am I out of the woods? So the, the complications of penile implant are really high. It's very disheartening. If you look in a textbook, it'll say that there's a 17% chance that the prosthesis needs to be removed, replaced, or revised in the first year. That's pretty darn high. Um, most of those problems have to do with infection. If the device is infected, it pretty much has to come out. While that's bad because you, you had to have your prosthesis removed. Generally, you can uh, you know, heal and get better over six months and try again at the six month mark. Um, the other possible complication is that the, when this attaches to the bone, even though we attach it very thoroughly, there's a small percentage that come loose from the bone. That's quite inconvenient because we have to go back in and, and replace it. Um, if there is a problem with malfunction of the device, it has to be replaced. The only good news I have for you about that is that replacement is usually kind of a low-key affair. Uh, generally, the device is removed and there's a body space in the shape of a penile prosthesis in there and we're able to put the uh, next device, sort of click it into that exact same body space and it ends up being kind of a low-key surgery for you. Not much swelling, not much pain. Um, so when are you out of the woods? Well, from infection, you're probably not out of the woods until a year has passed. The latest infection we've had is 10 months after surgery, and that can be pretty heartbreaking because you're doing great, you're doing great, you're doing great, and then one day you wake up with redness, swelling, pain, all out of proportion. You were fine yesterday, and it's because the device is infected and needs to be removed. The device breaks or moves probably you know, it's possible you're sort of never out of the woods for that, and this is how I think about that. Let's say you make it through your first year, you're okay, device is great, you're using it and you're not having problems. Then what can happen is that each year after that, that could be the year for you that it, that it breaks or comes loose from the bone or maybe starts to push a little bit out too far out the tip and require uh, revision. Maybe the first year, the chance of that is 5 or 10%. Maybe the next year, the chance of that is 10 or 20%. We don't really know. Now, that sounds pretty hopeless, but the fact of the matter is, we've got lots of prostheses that are in place and doing well seven years after they've been uh, implanted. So it's not all bad news. But, you know, it's, um, it's a surgery that uh, takes a lot of care to do correctly. In terms of the 17% risk, you know, we have painstakingly fought that complication rate and just made the surgery a little bit better, a little bit better uh, uh, as time went on. And we don't have anything close to a 17% rate. It's much lower than that. Uh, I do want to take the opportunity to talk to you a little about what we do for infection. We look like crazy people. We are fighting infection so hard. So the first thing we do is we give you... Um, you know, we make sure you don't have a urinary tract infection. Then we give you some oral antibiotics for the few days before surgery and for the days after. Then right before surgery, we give you incredibly strong IV antibiotics in your vein. Um, then when we actually prepare the skin, instead of just scrubbing it as we normally would, we scrub it three separate times with three separate agents. Uh, we're really going bananas here. Um, during the case, the... Uh, Surgical wounds are washed out with a different antibiotic irrigation. And then each of the devices is actually let sit in a, um, 
high strength antibiotic solution. And there's a special characteristic of silicon in that it actually absorbs that antibiotic. And so for the next week in your body, it's sort of eluding uh, antibiotic. Um, <coughs> excuse me, finally. <coughs> <clears throat> this is not coronavirus. Um, so allergies are pretty bad in, uh, in Austin if you've ever visited. Um, and the final thing is that we would never touch the device either to your skin or with our hands except using freshly changed gloves. So really we go through a lot of steps that make us look like uh, crazy people almost, but we've been rewarded with a lower uh, infection rate than is expected. Okay. What are the benefits of having testicle implants and penile implant placed in different stages? So I think there is a benefit to having the testicle implants placed and then later doing the penile prosthesis. Now that isn't to say that I think you should break it up into two procedures. I don't think that's worth it. But let's say you're having another kind of procedure earlier. Maybe you're having a liposuction or something like that it may be reasonable to take advantage of that surgical um, uh, setting to go ahead and place the testicular prostheses. The reason for that is that the testicle prostheses are maybe responsible for, I don't know, 5% of the total complications. So if you can sort of separate that from the penile prosthesis, maybe that's uh, a good way to decrease the total risk. If we're using a semi-rigid, you'd get two prostheses, and those would just stay in and we wouldn't mess with that at the time of the penile prosthesis placement. If we do an inflatable, you remember that one of these becomes your testicle, so we'd remove that testicle prosthesis and just drop this in the same place. Um, so anyway, I'm a big fan of doing testicular prostheses in earlier stages, if at all possible, but not necessarily a big fan of doing extra surgery and busting it out into two parts uh, unnecessarily. So I hope I made that clear. Um, is there anything the patient can do to reduce implant complications? You know, the implant complications are high, we can agree, and we're doing a lot. If there was really something simple that would make complications go down, you have to believe me that we would tell that to you and you would do it. Um, we do ask you to take, uh, to do two things to cleanse the skin ahead of time. One is that the regular old shower. Um, that sounds goofy, but, um, you know, everybody does life differently. Uh, and so well, the way I would handle that is I would take a shower the night before surgery, and I would take a shower the morning of surgery. The second is to use um, chlorhexidine, which is a kind of um, antibacterial soap. And if you look online, there's all these crazy instructions about how to use chlorhexidine. Um, and I'll just give you a simplified version of what I think is reasonable. So the night before surgery, you'll uh, buy some chlorhexidine soap, can be available at any uh, drugstore. You'll take your normal shower. Then go ahead and slather that stuff on pretty much in a bathing suit distribution. Uh, so, and leave it for a few minutes and then lightly rinse it off. Do that same thing the following morning. Take your normal shower, slather on the chlorhexidine, leave it a few minutes, then lightly rinse it off. We think that uh, if you can decrease the amount of the bacteria that we have normally living on our skin, that that might help a little bit. Uh, I don't think it's a major issue because the complication rate can be high whether you uh, do that or don't do that, but we think that's a good step. Don't do any shaving within a week of the surgery. There's this mistaken feeling, I think, in some patients that if they, uh, that they'll do their own shaving, please let us do the shaving. When you shave, you make a bunch of, a million microscopic little nicks and cuts. And over about three days, they kind of micro-infect. It's usually okay, it's not a problem, but uh, this is known to increase the risk of complications at surgery, any surgery. So within a week of surgery, no shaving, let us do it sterilely. Uh, at the time of the actual operation. Okay, how long do I need to be off work? Probably two answers for that. The um, inflatable penile prosthesis requires that we actually cut the fascia or sort of gristle that holds your abdominal wall in and work under the muscle, and then we have to sew that up. 
that can be a little sensitive there. And if you lift too much in the first weeks, six weeks after surgery, you could bust open those sutures. So if you have an inflatable penile prosthesis, we ask you to do no heavy lifting greater than 10 pounds for six weeks. For some people, that has implications for their job. Most people are not going to need to take more than two, maximum three weeks off work. Uh, but you may, depending on your circumstances, need to go back light duty or something like that. Um, a lot of people want to know when can they start working out again. So if it's inflatable penile prosthesis, it's six weeks. If it's a semi-rigid where we don't have to do anything to the abdominal wall, uh, I'd probably wait a solid month. I will emphasize that after penile prosthesis, you can't have intercourse for three months. We need everything to really heal in, scar in, and do well um, before you stress it by having intercourse. Here's a question, can you feel the implant through the skin of the penis? So I spend a lot of time in trouble placing the prosthesis in the right place. And the right place to me is about 20% of the way past your coronal ridge or glands ridge. That leaves a nice cap of healthy tissue above it. Um, if you have a semi-rigid, you can absolutely feel the tip of this thing. 100% you can feel it. Uh, because it's rigid and your tissue is soft. So if I sort of hide this under my thumb and feel in there, yes, I can feel it. Um, you also should be able to feel the um, uh, inflatable prosthesis when it's, um, when it's pumped up. I will tell you that after surgery, I generally leave the prosthesis pumped up about 30 or 40 percent. And that's so that the scar tissue doesn't sort of bind it. I want it to be a little bit plump. Um, it won't be a full-on erection, but it'll be slightly erect. What we do afterwards is that I see you in clinic the following week. And some people, their pain and swelling is down to the point where I can start to blow it up and teach you how to blow it up. At that point, you're going to do something called cycling it, which is that twice a day, you're going to blow it up, leave it blown up for four or five minutes, and then cycle it back down and completely take all the water out of it. You're going to do that for six weeks after surgery. Um, and that just makes sure that you, again, don't get this scar tissue kind of holding it uh, in and making sh uh, not allowing it to expand later. Um, back on the implant through the skin. So, you know, the problem is that the device, especially the semi-rigid device, is pretty rigid. It's pretty tough. And it's being placed within a structure which is reasonably delicate. Uh, the inside of the phallus has you know, fat and your skin is just skin. And so um, it is possible over time to get it sort of pushing out a little bit on the end of the phallus. If that causes redness or really is getting worse, it could be that we've got to revise that and shorten it up and kind of redo that portion of the operation. Um, how many years does the pump last? I think I sort of talked about that in that, yes, they sometimes break, not commonly but they do, um, and it's the kind of thing that if you showed up at year three and said, oh, it doesn't work anymore, I'd be like, yes, that sounds right, and then we would have to replace it. But I will emphasize, we've got plenty of people who are seven years out uh, who are doing just fine. How many years does the rod last? Maybe the same answer. Uh, to me, the rod isn't gonna break in most cases, but there's something about this rigid rod in this somewhat delicate phallus that it kind of inexorably keeps pushing out. And so I think the complication that people who have had a semi-rigid prosthesis will notice is that uh, over time it may be sort of pushing out through the tip and we may need to do a procedure where it's revived and shortened a little bit. Um, which implant is better for sex? Well, you know, all that implants do is stiffen the phallus for purposes of intercourse. That's it. There's no magic. I did have one patient say, well, it doesn't fill my entire penis. I'm like, well, I'm glad it doesn't because, you know, it's a foreign body and you don't want it filled with, with, uh, uh, with a foreign body. You just want a rigid phallus. Um, and so both work, I think, uh, very well for that purpose. I'm an avid cyclist. Can I use the rod because I prefer its simplicity? So I guess this is my feeling. Um, there's no question that 
having a semi-rigid prosthesis where you basically have a chubby all the time uh, is going to cause some problems for wearing a Speedo, for, I don't know, high jumping, something. There's going to be things that makes it difficult to do. I see bicycling as being something where it's sort of distant from your phallus, so probably you could keep bicycling. I will say that it, it's not convenient, but it certainly is possible that if you have a semi-rigid prosthesis and it just doesn't work for your lifestyle, then you could have it converted over to um, a inflatable prosthesis uh, if you need. How many hours is implant surgery? This is medium small surgery in my view. Um, it's, you know, about an hour, maximum two. I do want to mention something else about what's possible during surgery. So it's pretty important that the phallus lines up with the bone because I'm going to hook this to the bone, right? This guy's going to be out like this. What if my phallus is down here? Then it's going to make some sort of zany, you know, S-shape prosthesis, which is no good. So I work very hard to make sure that the phallus is perfectly centered over the bone. If you need just a little bit of penile lift, that can be done at the same time. So the way this procedure is done is a small incision is made a couple inches above the uh, phallus. And if you don't need any penile lift, it's a pretty small incision like that. If you need a bit of penile lift, then the size of the incision is a little bit determined by you. What I'll do in pre-op clinic is sort of pull up on the tissue there and sort of see how much lift I get and you can sort of see how much tissue I'm going to have to remove to get a lift. We can do like medium to small lift, no problem, at the same time as penile prosthesis. If you really need a severe penile lift, you should probably do that in a separate procedure. Um, because in that case, often I have to remove a lot of tissue, it's a very large incision, and if that thing gets infected, maybe 5% chance, then it'll probably infect your prosthesis and you'll lose the prosthesis. So if you really need a major penile lift, let's do that in two procedures for maximum safety. Um, how long do I need to stay in the area and how many post-op visits would there be? There's kind of a two answers to this. I actually prefer two post-op visits because I'll tell you it can be really rough to have a penile prosthesis on Friday and then see me on Wednesday and I'm hogging on your scrotum that just had surgery to blow this thing up. It takes a fair amount of pressure to get this done and you may not thank me. You just had surgery, you got a lot of swelling and pain. Um, and so if it's possible for your schedule, a lot of times I like to leave a second visit where you can come back, swelling is less, pain is less, and you do, you're just a lot happier uh, to have to you be squeezing and me be squeezing on your recently operated scrotum. How long after fallow can I get my implants? Two answers for that as well. If you have no problems or complications with your fallow, we usually do it at nine months after the phalloplasty. Now, if you have a urethral problem, such as urethral stricture, you pretty much need to get that all taken care of and then wait about six months to make sure everything's fine and you don't need any more urethral surgery. Uh, before you have a penile prosthesis. It's somewhere between difficult and impossible to fix a urethral stricture with a penile prosthesis in place. There's such an excellent chance that we'll ruin the prosthesis working on your urethra. So you really want all of your other urethral problems taken care of and then have the penile prosthesis. The other thing I'll say is that we can do penile prosthesis together with a small list of other procedures. Maybe we can do a glansplasty or a redo glansplasty at the same time. That would be safe. Uh, we probably can't do hardly any or no urethral surgery. You know, when you operate on the eyes or ears or mouth or urethra, that's only semi-sterile because it's really impossible to get the inside of the urethra or your eyes or your mouth completely sterile. We shouldn't mix that with this hyper-sterile surgery of putting in a penile prosthesis. So in general, I would prefer not to do any urethral surgery at the same time. Uh, within reason, you can have other surgeries in other parts of your body. Sometimes we'll do a top surgery revision at the same time of penile prosthesis, and that's perfectly safe. Uh, can an implant cause a stricture? In general, no. 
one of the, you know, we're, we're going to, in general, be far away from your urethra. It's, it's a little bit of a party trick. When this is placed inside your phallus, I need to make a space but stay away from the artery, the vein, the nerves, the skin, and the urethra. Um, I mean, that's why it's a difficult operation. And usually we're successful at doing that. I have had at least one and maybe two patients. Both patients were RFF patients with particularly narrow phalluses that basically there just wasn't enough room to get in there safely. Uh, in one case, uh, the prosthesis, I think, eroded into the urethra, and that was a major problem, as you can imagine. Um, it didn't cause a stricture, but it did require the prosthesis to be removed. So it's not impossible, but it's awfully rare to have a urethral problem. Having said that, some people get temporary peeing problems afterwards. So imagine that you've got your phallus and everything's fine, and then I'm going to go do a procedure where I... Uh, operate within within the confines of the phallus and then place a device in there that could cause some swelling and you may notice that for a few weeks after surgery it's like a little hard to pee not not a big emergency but just something you just notice uh, and then as the swelling goes down over time that gets better very rarely but it does happen once or twice a year to us you basically wake up from the procedure and you're like i can't pee that can be a big emergency um, you may need a temporary urethral catheter for a few days, or we might even have to bring you back to the operating room and place a penile press, uh, excuse me, place a suprapubic tube. Imagine that that's pretty tricky because you've got all of this tubing in there. I can't place the suprapubic tube anywhere near the tubing. It's going to infect it. So generally what I do is take you back personally because I know where all the goodies are and then place the suprapubic tube in, a, in an area that it won't affect the rest of the prosthesis. So peeing problems can be a thing after this. Thank God they're not very common. My phallus is less than four inches. Can I still get an implant? So yeah, definitely. Um, whatever size penis you have, uh, we can have an implant that fixes it or fits it. Realize that these comes in multiple lengths. So uh, we actually measure and then give you uh, the inflatable prosthesis that fits. The semi-rigids are quite long and we actually trim them down to size and get it to be the exact right size. So whatever size phallus you've got, we custom make you a correctly sized prosthesis. That's cool. Um, I don't have a scrotum. Can I still get the pump and have it placed in my abdomen? So it's a slightly tricky but not impossible to place a inflatable penile prosthesis in a patient without a scrotum. So in the case that there isn't a scrotum, usually the labia majora are left in place. And in that case, the uh, pump will actually be placed in the labia majora. Uh, there's lots of cis women who've gotten a similar pump because of incontinence problems. It's a same pump, different indication um, that have uh, the pump placed in the labia. I can foresee a problem that it might be a little tricky to have enough sort of loose tissue to be able to grab across the tissue and get to the pump and then grab across the tissue and get to the release valve. Um, but it's not impossible and I think it's absolutely worth trying if that's the device that you're most interested in. How are implants anchored to my body? So um, we clear off the pubic bone and pubic bones looking something like this. So we clear off the tissue down here and then two incredibly strong sutures made of titanium, uh, it's, it's called fiber wire, uh, are placed through the periosteum. That's the really tough, thick covering over bone and a little bit into bone to really anchor it. And honestly, I anchor that like it's my job because it is. Uh, really, really tough. And then it's placed, the stitch is placed through the end of the prosthesis and tied down times two. And then imagine that you've got these loose, loose threads here. I can kind of wrap it around and kind of entrap it against the bone and tie it a second time. And that, together with your own body sort of scarring and healing in, generally makes a thorough attachment. 
I think in the bad old days, we had a larger number of times where the uh, prosthesis came off the bone. Now that we're using unbreakable titanium suture, it seems to be less common. Um, it's still an issue, but it's less of an issue. Always trying to improve this little bit kludgy surgery. How long after surgery will I have to walk around with an erection? Well, after inflatable prosthesis, I've told you that it'll be about 40% um, inflated, and that's a partial erection, but I just don't think it's that much trouble. Reminding you that a semi-rigid, it's always erect. It's either erect up or erect down, and no time like the present to get to learn how to deal with that. You'll learn how to tuck it or uh, leave it in your underwear, however it works for you. Um, at the first visit, I'll be able to uh, pump it up and down and make sure everything's working great, teach you to pump it up and down, and then in between those times when you're um, cycling it twice a day, which you'll do for six weeks after the surgery, you can leave it completely uh, flat. So, not so very long. Which implant is better for ALT? Which implant is better for RFF? I don't think that the implant really matters for which type of phalloplasty you have. Um, you know, uh, the only problem that I've ever seen, and it's quite rare, is the very small number of patients, like less than one in a hundred, uh, usually RFF patients, where the phallus is really, really, really narrow. Uh, and you can just imagine the difficulties that if I'm dealing with a phallus that that's, that's that narrow, I've got an artery and a vein I've got to be nice to, I've got a urethra I've got to be nice to, and I've got skin I've got to be nice to. So it could be really hard to thread the needle uh, and make it work with a super thin phallus. But that problem is the same for both inflatable and semi-rigid devices. So I think it's down to your preference for which type you have. I didn't get UL with my fallow. Can I still get an implant? Absolutely, yeah. So for folks that don't want or need a urethral lengthening, you already know that that causes, that sort of opens you up to having less complications from surgery because you don't get any of the fistula or stricture complications. Um, and it definitely doesn't mess you up for placing penile prosthesis uh, at all. When my device gets pumped up, my fallow points to the left. Is there anything I can do about that? Oh, that's hard to say. You know, the issue is that the phalloplasty, by the time the penile prosthesis is placed, is sort of healed up and it's the way it is. And any problems with asymmetric healing or anything like that should probably be dealt with. And once the phallus is the way the phallus is, when you place in the penile prosthesis, uh, it's probably still gonna be that way. So if you've got a little left cant or right cant, you're probably still gonna have that. Um, it's awfully difficult to fix issues with the phallus with the prosthesis in place. If it's really troublesome, I could see a scenario where the prosthesis is removed, it's fixed, and then placed back later. I mean, if it makes you feel any better, as a urologist, I can tell you that uh, many cis males have phalluses that go all kinds of different ways, up, left, right. Um, it, it's pretty common to have a little cant one way or the other. And so that may put you in good company with having a little left-sided cant uh, to the phallus. I'm super active and outdoorsy. Which implant is better for my lifestyle? You know, it, if you're coming to me as a triathlete, you basically should get uh, inflatable prosthesis because my, I imagine, I'm no triathlete, that having um, a erect penis 24-7 with the semi-rigid could be a problem for you. Um, so I generally advise patients who self-identify as being really active uh, to consider the inflatable prosthesis. How long can I leave my phallus erect with a pump or rod? So if it's a rod, it's erect all the time. Erect up, erect down, no problems. You know, in general, I don't want you to leave the prosthesis up for days and days and days. 
Um, for starters, there's no need for it. Like, you know, the whole point of having this is that it pumps up and pumps down again. It's sort of like if you owned a car and you never turned it off. I mean, I suppose you could do that, but why would you do that? So the answer is, you know, don't leave it inflated for uh, excessively long time. That just seems like we're inviting problems and uh, disaster doing that. Um, does the liquid reservoir ever rupture? The reservoir itself is pretty tough and I've never seen it rupture, but what can happen is that there's some connection points that we get made and sometimes these leak. Um, you can imagine that uh, if this tube rubs on part of your body or perhaps on another tube that it can kind of work a hole in there um, or the valve which is you know kind of a miracle of engineering right this is a device that is made you know it's been made since the late 1960s and they've the engineers have meticulously improved it over the years so it doesn't fail much but it doesn't fail never either uh, so to me, those are the three sort of sources for you wake up one day and it just doesn't work. Uh, a small hole, valve problem, or leakage through the connector. Are implants covered by insurance? Yes, they are, uh, amazingly. I would argue that the vast majority of my patients, 96, maybe 98%, have uh, insurance coverage. I can give you a little hint about insurance. For starters, um, many of the major carriers cover transgender surgery. Um, United Healthcare, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna, but realize that there's a couple of caveats there. They each have like very specific and individual products. So 100 people could have United Healthcare and it works great for them. But you happen to have the one product that's very specifically says we don't cover transgender surgery. So trick one is to either inquire uh, about whether it's covered with your insurance company or read the paperwork. Um, I have seen only one time the testicular prostheses weren't covered, just very specifically. They said, we don't care why, we have, we, whoever you are or whatever your reason for the, for the testicular prosthesis, this insurance product doesn't cover it. Uh, but in most cases, they are covered. I will say, too, that, you know, we help you with insurance. So um, we have a group of insurance ninjas that query your insurance company about um, covered benefits and set you up for surgery and get pre-authorization for the surgery. A lot of times, things will be covered, but only when we really talk to your surgeons a lot. And so we have to do things like uh, we need often about 90 days to be able to uh, discuss with them the ins and outs of your surgery. And sometimes we have to have a conversation with them called a peer-to-peer -peer conversation where we very sweetly discuss the operation with them and sort of say, look, I think this is a covered benefit. You should cover it. Um, I can't say exactly how often I'm successful. It's at least 50% of the time. It might be closer to 80%. If there's an absolute prohibition against, say, that one case I told you about where they said, look, no testicular prostheses for any reason, then there's really no convincing them. But if there's some wiggle room there, then often we're experienced at speaking to them and uh, getting it covered uh, if possible. I had a rod place in the past, but would like to change to a pump. Is that possible? Yeah, it's completely possible. Um, it might not even be a big deal because think about it. The uh, area in the phallus is already dissected out and been done, so all we have to do is just place the new device in that old space. You will have to have the pump, or uh, correction, the reservoir placed, but that's usually kind of low-key. And you will already have, likely, a testicular implant in. And it's dead easy to just take the testicle implant out and drop the new pump in. So if anything, it's like less surgery to do it after you've had a uh, semi-rigid prosthesis in place before. Will an implant add girth to my phallus? Short answer is not much. Um, and so, like in a semi-rigid, clearly you're placing a, you know something with mass into your phallus. So maybe it makes it slightly more plump. But also the tissue within the phallus is kind of soft. 
So it more kind of pushes it out of the way than really makes the phallus pretty big. Um, you know, I think you'll get small increase in girth, but nothing really notable. Um, to me, girth is a good and a bad thing. Some people ask that because they want to be girthier, and I think the right answer is it's probably not going to make it hugely girthier, but maybe a little bit. And there are other folks who are already girthy enough, and they don't want it to make their phallus bigger. And to those people, I say, look, it's either going to make it slightly bigger or not bigger. So it really doesn't increase girth a lot. Okay. Look, this is a big, long question. I'm going to read the whole thing. I'm wondering with the implant, what would, would you be able to adjust the angle of the penis? I think not. Remember that in the case of a cis male erection or our goals in a, in a phalloplasty erection is a rigid penis. Isn't it a rigid penis with like this crazy configuration or that crazy configuration? It's just a rigid penis. So um, I don't really think that you've got a lot of control over the angle the same way that a cis male doesn't have a lot of control over his angle when he's got an erection. So you get what we all get with these procedures. Um, this is awesome. Would there be a sound associated with re-angling the penis? Because I guess there's a sex toy that makes a sound that when you move it. Um, so no, I don't think there'll be a sound associated. I mean, you could see pretty soundless design here uh, for both of them. You're, you might be able to hear, let's see if you can hear this. You might be able to hear that there's actually, in this case, you can sort of detect that the water is going through, but that's because this device has got air mixed with the water to makes a little noisy. You do get a sense though of like water, when you press it down, you sort of feel like, oh, I just pumped some water somewhere. Maybe not a sound, but definitely uh, some sort of sensation. Look, eventually this will become second nature to you. This will be part of your body. You'll pump it up when you need it. You'll bring it down when you don't need it. Uh, it'll be no big thing. Um, do you mind elaborating on how erect the penis would look? Well, the penis will look erect. Maybe you can model this by grabbing the unerect penis, pulling it on stretch. That's it, um, except that it's got a stiffener in it. Uh, I really want to emphasize that there's no magic to penile prostheses. They don't really change the nature of your phallus very much. They make it rigid for intercourse. That's what they do. Um, yeah, so there's a question about how much you'd see it. So realize that with a semi-rigid prosthesis, correction, um, inflatable penile prosthesis, you know, at the resting uh, situation, it's, it's just going to be completely flaccid. So you'll have the phallus that you have. Uh, it won't really be troublesome. There's no question that a semi-rigid prosthesis is harder to conceal. And I only half-jokingly say you know, I hope you don't like Speedos because they're going to arrest you if you show up at the uh, pool with your big chubby and your, and your Speedos. So concealability can be an issue. So I encourage you to think about that before you pick uh, which type of prosthesis you get. Can someone request an uncircumcised penis? Well, that's a little off topic, but I'll say anyway. So there is no way in the 21st century right now to make a foreskin. When you have uh, a phalloplasty, um, what you get is the appearance of the phallus and the coronal ridge or penis head. But there's no way to make, at this moment, the skin that drapes over the tip like someone who is uncircumcised. Okay, I think I did a good job on those. All right. How can I reduce complications? Uh, I mean, I guess I'll say, you know, follow the instructions that we give you. Take the antibiotics that we give you. If you've got diabetes, make sure that you uh, have blood sugar in really perfect control. This is important before, during, and after surgery. Um, definitely do the HIPAA cleanse, which is the chlorhexidine shower the night before and the morning of. Uh, in the absence of that, definitely take a good shower. Uh, where you wash your, your privates perfectly well um, the night before and the morning of uh, the procedure. I think all of those things help. Okay, if my prosthesis needs to be removed, what then? So getting a prosthesis removed can feel 
really defeating. Uh, it's defeating for us and it's defeating for you. And I like to feel like I approach my job with just the maximum amount of go get it this <laughs> to make things better and that's one of the reasons why we've you know worked so hard to just get the complication rate down 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 and we've been partially successful um, in that um, but if it needs to be removed basically you leave it alone live your life and at the six month mark if you want to try again we can try again I don't really know if having a single infection and needing it removed implies that you have a higher risk of infection. There's some pretty sophisticated thinking and about how people are hosts to certain bacteria and maybe people that get like a, like there's a particularly nasty bacteria called Pseudomonas. If you get a Pseudomonas infect infection or you're a Pseudomonas carrier, you might imagine that you have a higher chance of getting Pseudomonas later. So I think at this moment, that we don't have good evidence that getting one infection is gonna make you have other infections. But if we were forced to really think about it hard, we could see some situations where you say, oh, that poor person has a higher chance of infections than the next person. In any case, I think it's worthwhile to try again after a period of healing. My prosthesis needs to be replaced, what then? So as I mentioned before, Prosthesis replacement uh, is a little bit of a lower key thing. So there's a couple reasons why I've had to replace a prosthesis. One is that the prosthesis malfunctioned, in which case the prosthesis is removed and entirely new fresh prosthesis is placed. And as I said, I placed that into the same body space uh, as before, and it ends being kind of uh, low key surgery, more low key than placing it for the very first time. Uh, I've definitely had to re-sew the prosthesis to the bone a couple times and that also is kind of limited surgery and not very very big deal. Um, I can't think of any other situations where I've needed to do that but the only good news is that replacement tends to be a little bit lower key operation. <coughs> what do I have to worry about immediately preoperatively? So I mentioned before that there's the issue of strictures. So you'll want to make sure that you don't have um, any urethral strictures and that a certain number of months have passed since your last urethral stricture repair or fistula repair to make sure that it's going to stay uh, fixed before you uh, move into the penile prosthesis. Um, we do need a urine culture before this operation. Now, sometimes people are a little bit unsure about the difference between urinalysis and urine culture. So urinalysis is a very simple urine procedure, often where they just dip the uh, uh, a little indicator strip in there, and it'll say if you've got white cells or red cells in there. But for this, we need an actual urine culture. And that's where they uh, put the urine out um, on a culture plate, and then we know if you have any bacteria growing there and which antibiotics affect them. So just realize that there's a special situation here with prosthesis that we need to make sure you don't have a, cult, a positive culture. Secondly, uh, there's certain surgeries that we give you antibiotics ahead of time and afterwards by mouth uh, in pill form, and this is one of them, so you can expect that. And I'll remind you again, no shaving, please. You're not helping us. Uh, some will say like, oh, I shaved for you, and it's just like, oh, because <coughs> as I mentioned, shaving makes these little micro cuts the micro cuts infect actually increases your chance of infection with surgery, not decreases. Excuse me. Barring complications, how long does this prosthetic last? The semi rigid device lasts a long time because it's really tough. Um, I think over time it's still possible to have a small number come off the bone, or possible that over the years it just keeps kind of moving and pushing the uh, skin of the tip of the phallus and needs to be shortened and revised. Uh, but in general, they last a good long time. Uh, the semi rigid's the same way. The way I've thought about it and the way I've tried to communicate it is that they certainly have a breakage rate every year. So it's almost like rolling a dice. Like I'm in my second year, what's my chance? 5%. Ah, I won. No problem. Second year, what's my chance? I don't know, 10%. 
damn it, I lost. So in the second year, it gets replaced. But <clears throat> there's just plenty of people who've gone on and on without having any problems and need no further attention uh, for their prosthesis. I think that's it, folks. So we uh, went through dozens and dozens of questions. I hope you understand more about penile prostheses. Um, feel vis free to visit us online at cranects.com. Uh, and, you know, we specialize not just in phalloplasty. We're the highest volume phalloplasty uh, service in the world. Um, uh, and in penile prostheses, because obviously lots of phalloplasties means lots of penile prostheses. But really in revision surgery, it's, it's very, very common for us to see folks that need this or that type of revision surgery. And we're happy to work with you and help you with that. Um, you know, we've spent each individual surgeon in our practice has spent, in many cases, decades getting to where they are. And then imagine that we work in an environment where it's all transgender surgery all the time. So when I joined the practice, I was 18 years a reconstructive urologist. So I had a big toolkit. Um, and then now add that I join a practice that every day is doing different transgender surgery. So my learning curve was like that. And uh, initially when I joined years ago, we thought, oh, it might take us five months to really make me an expert. It, it didn't. It probably took a couple months to make me an expert because the volume was so high. Um, so the point is, we're here for you. We've, we've spent significant chunks of our lives honing ourselves into specialist surgeons. Uh, and, um, you know, we love to do what we do. Uh, I have to tell you that not only do I love the work, I love the patients. So I, um, it, it's sort of my honor and privilege to be part of this journey with you. Um, honestly, uh, it, it's the apex of a long uh, career. So I'm really glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here too. Thanks. Have a good rest of your day.